All righty. Um, like I told you we we're going to do something a little different this hour. So I want to talk about the, maybe I got to make this a little smaller. I see it's going off. The already but not yet, which is a, a theme in biblical theology. And um, so I'm just going to show you examples of it and then apply it. Well, already the, the blessings we already have in Christ, not yet, what we're still waiting for. So the already, what's been inaugurated for us, uh, the not yet, what is still to be consummated in the future. So this is not a hard concept, but I just want to show it to you in the Bible the, in terms of the kingdom. Is there a not yet? Yeah, there's a not yet because we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. So there's a not yet element to the kingdom. We pray, right, regularly. I hope you pray this prayer regularly. Jesus taught us to pray this prayer, so we should be praying it regularly, right? Sometimes, sometimes Baptists don't pray this prayer because Catholics memorize it, but then sometimes we don't pray it very much at all. <laughs> but Jesus taught this prayer to be prayed regularly, and we pray your kingdom come because it hasn't come completely in its consummation. Jesus speaks of inheriting the kingdom prepared for you. Now, that's... The inheritance, right, is something that's coming in the future, something that we don't experience right now. Or he says, I tell you, speaking to the Jews, Jesus says in Matthew 8, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Many Gentiles, this is the story of the centurion who believes, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, my focus here is that that messianic feast that's coming in the kingdom, we haven't experienced that yet. And then Jesus speaks of drinking wine in the kingdom, doesn't he, at the Lord's Supper. That's something that will be experienced in the future. So there's, that's the not yet, right? But there's an already. The kingdom, the kingdom has come in Jesus. And, and we see that in the exercising of demons, not the exorcising, not exercising, right, of demons. Matthew 12, 28, if by the Spirit of God uh, I cast out demons, I need the word, if, oh, there's the I, if I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So Jesus cast out a demon, and what does he say? The kingdom has come, the kingdom is present. The king kingdom has arrived in, uh, in the casting out uh, of demons. Or, or uh, we see the kingdom come, the kingdom is present, and Jesus' miraculous signs in his healings and in his, and in his preaching. So, you know, um, sometimes people ask, why, why don't we see healing um, Today, as we saw in Jesus' ministry, now, of course, some, some charismatics would argue that we do see the same amount of healings that we do see in Jesus' ministry. Some would even say we see more. I'm not, I'm not persuaded of that view. Uh, I, I think we see a high point of healing in Jesus' ministry because you have that conflict that we were talking about between uh, Satan and the kingdom reach uh, a, a crisis point when Jesus comes on the scene. But, but Jesus healing people, raising people from the dead, those are all anticipations, right, of the new creation, aren't they? They, 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 all, they all point to the consummation of the kingdom. Because when we're raised from the dead, we'll never be sick again, Right? will never die again. But, but they aren't the consummation of the kingdom, right? Because all the people Jesus healed, they got sick again and they died, didn't they? Even the people Jesus raised from the dead, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, the widow of Nain's son, they all died again. <laughs> they had to die twice. Have you thought of that, right? They were raised from the dead, but then they died again. So, yes, it's a... It's the presence of the kingdom, and yet it's not the consummation yet, is it? It's, a, it's an anticipation of what's to come. 
Of course, the kingdom is present in Jesus' preaching. Uh, I, actually, we could say the kingdom is present in his preaching because, because the spirit is at work, right? The spirit is the, is the sign of the kingdom. So that's a clear already. And, and the kingdom is present in the person of Jesus. Jesus says to the Pharisees, the kingdom of God is among you. Some, some English translations translate that the kingdom of God is within you. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. Pharisees were unbelievers. He's speaking in Luke 17 here to the Pharisees. I think he's saying the kingdom of God is among you in my person. In Jesus, the kingdom is present. But it's not the fullness of the kingdom, right? There's still sin, evil, and death. And then we see the kingdom is present because Jesus tells us the kingdom is like a mustard seed. And it's like leaven. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's small. And in fact, that was the smallest seed in Jesus' day, right? So he picked the smallest known seed. And, and what is he saying? The kingdom, the people can miss, people can miss the presence of the kingdom. Or the kingdom is like, um, like yeast or leaven hidden in dough. It's, the kingdom is hidden. It's, it, but it is present. It's present like a mustard seed is present. It's present like yeast is present in, in dough. So all these are examples of the already not yet. Here's a, here's a definition of uh, the kingdom that comes from a person named George Ladd who wrote a lot about the kingdom. He said the kingdom of God is the redemptive reign of God. So it's, notice the word redemptive. The redemptive, the saving reign, right? The saving rule of God, dynamically active to establish his rule among men. And that this kingdom, which will appear as an apocalyptic act at the end of the age, that's the not yet, right? It will appear as an apocalyptic act at, at the end of the age. But it's already come into human history in the person and mission of Jesus to overcome evil to deliver men from its power and to bring them into the blessings of God's reign. So I like that definition. It's a nice example of the already not yet. So here, here's another example of the already not yet, and it's when John talks about eternal life. I don't know if you've thought of this before. Maybe you're very familiar with this. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see the language of the kingdom but John only uses the language of the kingdom for the kingdom of God four times. But he uses the word eternal life over and over again. Here's what Jesus says. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So that's the life of the age to come, right? But right now, those who believe, that's all of us in this room, presumably, hopefully, we right now have the life of the, of the coming age already. The, the, the coming age has invaded this pre present age. He does not come into judgment. The final judgment has, so to speak, been passed. But he has passed now from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead, I think he means spiritually dead here, not physically dead, when the spiritually dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. I think that's spiritual life. Now, now we live if we trust in Jesus. But we live and yet we die, right? That's the already not yet. And here's the not yet. John says, or Jesus says in John 5, don't mar same chapter, a few verses down the road, don't marvel at this, don't be astonished at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's the not yet, isn't it? There's a resurrection coming. There's a physical resurrection. Is it a physical resurrection? Yeah, because before, remember I set up here, the dead are the spiritually dead. But this is a physical resurrection because it's those who are in tombs, right? He's talking about corpses here. And that we'll, both the good and evil will hear his voice and will come out. And there'll be a resurrection of life, consummation. 
But, but, but you already have life, right? You already have eternal life, but it'll be a consummation of what you already have at the day of physical resurrection. So there, there we see the already, not yet again. At the same time, this is 1 John 2, 8, so we're still in John. It is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him now and in you, because the darkness is passing away. There's the already. The darkness hasn't passed away, but it is passing away, and the true light is already shining in Christ, right? That's the already. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31. Here's the not yet. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. As a husband, this is my life verse. So I've told my wife that, and she's like, that is my favorite verse in the Bible. Um, obviously, I'm kidding, right? I'll explain this verse more in a minute. The, those who mourn as those they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as those they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. We live in the not yet. What does Paul mean by this? Those who have wives should live as though they had none. Obviously, he, we have other passages where, which says husbands love your wives, cherish your wives, nourish your wives, care for your wives. But what does he mean by that? He means by this, your marriage is going to end, right? You're going to die. Don't invest everything into your marriage as if that's heaven on earth, because it isn't, right? That's what he means. That's why he says, those who mourn as though they were not mourning. But if there's a funeral, you mourn, right? Paul says, weep with those who weep, doesn't he? Right? He's not taking away from that. What is he saying? Every sorrow, and there are sorrows. We had very dear friends. They lost their a two-year-old daughter uh, a, a week ago. Uh, a two-year-old daughter who drowned. So, so tragic. They'll never get over that fully in this life. The, Paul's not denying that. He's saying every sorrow will end. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. So should you go into a wedding and say, congratulations, but I'm not that happy for you? So because of this verse. No, that's not what he's saying, right? He's saying every joy and every sorrow is temporary. It, don't, it doesn't last forever. And those who buy as though they had no goods. No, he's not saying you don't own anything. He's saying everything you have will not be permanent. Those who deal with this world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. There's the point, right? It's life is temporary. Life doesn't last forever. There's a not yet. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, these things happen to them as an example to them, Old Testament saints. He's just given a lot of examples. But they're written down for our instruction. On whom the end of the ages has come. So here's the, here's the already, right? The end of the ages has come in Christ. It's arrived. For Galatians 1, 4. Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. We're delivered now from the present evil age through the cross. The, the already has come. We're in a new situation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So there's the already again, right? The new creation has arrived. The old has passed away. The new has arrived. That doesn't mean that there's no consummation coming. So I'm just hitting you with a battery of verses, right? So you see it again and again. So 1 Corinthians 5, a person's guilty of incest. The, the Corinthians are bragging about how spiritual they are. So he says, your boasting isn't good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He says, don't you know that allowing that in your congregation without disciplining that person is corrupting the whole body? Cleanse out the old leaven, by which he means kick this guy out of the church because he's not repenting and you need to remove him. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. So he's saying, like, look, if you're going to be pure, 
If you're going to be pure, you need to remove that person from the church. He says, cleanse out that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. Which is it? Cleanse it out. Remove that person so you'll be a new lump, an unleavened lump. But then he says, but you really are unleavened. Do you see there? You really are unleavened in Christ for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. In Christ you're pure. You're unleavened. In Christ you're perfect. Right? That's what he's saying. You're, you really are unleavened because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He's thinking back to Exodus 12 and 13, isn't he? The Passover sacrifice where at the Feast of Unleavened Bread they removed all the unleavened bread from their houses. But he also says you need to remove the old leaven to really be a new lump, to be an unleavened lump. So do you see the tension there? You've got to remove the, the old leaven to be a pure lump. Actually, in Christ, you are unleavened. There's a tension there. There's that already not yet tension that's operating profoundly in this verse. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off already. You've put off the old self with its practices, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. You, you've put, you have, if you're a Christian, you've put off the old self and you've put on the new. But when we come to Ephesians, what does he say? Assuming that you've heard about Jesus and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Oops, I made that way too big. But you see what he's saying here? He says in Colossians, you have, you have put off the old self, and you have put on the new. But then in Ephesians, he says, put off what's been put off. Put on what's been put on. Here he gives a command. Put off your old self. But what if you raise your hand? Wait a minute. In Colossians, you said we've already done that. Well, put on the new self, but we've already done that. But do you see that tension again between really the, what's already true and what will fully be true in the end day? So, there's, a, there's kind of a paradox at work there. There's an already not yet dimension. We, we see this with adoption. Uh, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received, past tense, the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You are, if you're a Christian, you are adopted now as God's son. But a few verses later, he says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Well, wait a minute. He just said a few verses earlier, we are adopted. And now he says we're awaiting our adoption. Did Paul forget what he said a few minutes earlier? Well, first of all, we believe Scripture is inspired but even if you didn't believe Scripture is inspired, which I tr trust you all do, he's not that dumb, right, <laughs> to forget what he wrote five minutes before. No, he knows what he's doing. Yes, we, we've received adoption, and yet there's a future dimension of, uh, of our adoption which will be completed. In Christ, we have now redemption through his blood. What's redemption? Liberation freedom, ransom. We have that through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. But notice what he talked about up here. We wait eagerly for adoption of sons. We wait for the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies is future. We wait for it. So redemption is something we presently enjoy already, and there's a not yet dimension. We wait for the full 
redemption of our bodies. How about salvation? For by grace, you have been saved through faith. That's clearly past tense, isn't it? We already enjoy salvation. But often in the Bible, salvation is spoken of as future. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's something future, isn't it? We hope for it. For God has not destined us for wrath, he's thinking of the future, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to show you another verse, in case you doubt it. I'm sure you don't, but just in case. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved? Future tense. We will be saved through him from wrath that he pours out on the last day. The salvation here is future. We have been saved already. We will be saved. Not yet. What about sanctification? And such were some of you. You know, he's just talked about a bunch of sins, right, in this, in this passage. Uh, maybe, maybe we should even look at those verses. The unrighteous one inherit the kingdom of God, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, adulterers, males who have sex with male, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed in baptism, not baptismal regeneration, but baptism symbolizing what you're cleansing of sins. But you were sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Past tense. You're positionally sanctified, right? You're definitively sanctified. In Christ, you're sanctified. And you were justified. Okay, you know, I'm going to tell you a little story about this verse. Just break it up for a minute with a story. Ray Steadman, some, maybe some of you who are older remember Ray Steadman. He was the pastor of Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, California, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, when the hippies were coming along. And, you know, it was right next to Stanford University. A lot of, a lot of different people came to his church, and they had body life. And Sunday nights, they would just stand up and share things going on, and um, so one night Ray was preaching on this passage, and uh, a person came to the church who had just come out of prison, and he was preaching on this passage, and it says, right, he lists all these sins and says, such were some of you, and, and Ray said, if you belong in that category, such were some of you, stand up, okay, that, that's kind of cool, you know, he goes, stand up, hey, it was the 60s, right? And uh, so people stood up all around the congregation. And the prisoner looked around and he said, these are my kind of people. So, <laughs> and it's true, isn't it, right? That was, that was a great, I love that illustration because it's true. You know, in and of ourselves, we're not better. Yeah, it's a great story of the gospel. Anyway, that was, that was free. So you were sanctified, but our sanctification isn't complete, is it? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Wait a minute. You said here you were sanctified. Now he's saying sanctify us completely. Here's a prayer. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless when at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I think, when does this complete sanctification take place? With a nod to our Wesleyan friends who think it can happen in this life, but... We love them, but they're wrong. So uh, now he's not thinking of something that can happen in this life. May your whole spirit, spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it, but on the last day. So there's a not yet element to our sanctification. How about justification? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we're justified now by faith. We're declared to be right before God. But he can also say, for, the, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. A hope of righteousness being declared on the last day. So I, I picture it like this. We're, 
were already declared to be in the right before God by faith. The end time verdict of that last day has been declared in advance, right? So we have received the end time verdict by faith now. But you know, you can doubt it, right? You can question, am I really justified? Because it's a not yet reality. No, uh, there, there, there's a sense in which it's, it's already true if you have faith, but you can doubt it. But on the last day, it will be declared to the world and sealed to your conscience, right? Then, then, there'll be, then there'll never be a doubt again about your justification. So we wait for that final justification. So I've given you, I've given you a bunch of uh, examples. Now I'm going to apply it for a few minutes. So, you know, I'm talking about biblical theology, the already not yet. What does that look like? So we're going to think about the already and not yet, and we're going to think of mistakes that can be made on both sides. So uh, another way of a misunderstanding of the already could be called over-realized eschatology, which is another way of saying, right, heaven on earth, because that, that's the not yet. But we want heaven now, right? I want it now. We all want it now. So we can tend to fall. We can tend to overemphasize the already, or we can fall into the problem of underrealized eschatology, right? Where we deny God's present work. So how does that work out politically? So let's think of, you know, examples. I could think of a lot of other examples, but let's think of Marxism. So, you know, it depends on your experience. I'm, I'm from... I'm from Salem, Oregon, so from far away from here. I went to a small little col state college outside of Oregon, and almost all my teachers, this is the 70s, they were almost all Marxist. You know, I had a class on Plato's Republic, and we read it as a Marxist. I felt like I never learned about Plato. I learned about Marx. You know, all these guys were Marxist, uh, uh, and um, not all of my teachers were Marxist, but a lot of them were. What does Marxism say? Marxism basically says when the proletariat come in, there's going to be the kingdom of God on earth. What is that? That's over-realized eschatology. That's heaven on earth politically, right? Well, it's a, it's a total illusion, isn't it? Actually, we, we know wherever Marxism, Marxism has been tried politically, it's been an unmitigated disaster. Not only a disaster, but, but it's staggering how many people were killed under Mao and Stalin and so forth and so on, right? And we can even see now, right, under Xi in China, uh, the Uyghurs being uh, mistreated and persecuted and, and Christians experiencing that as well. So Mar what is Marxism? It's, it's a Christian heresy, isn't it? It's a promise of heaven on earth, but there is no heaven on earth. Instead, you know, I would argue, you know, no political system is perfect, but the American experiment, right, of uh, separation of powers is a prudential recognition that of the not yet, that there's still evil in this world, right? And therefore, you have the powers, you know, you have the legislative, executive, and judicial balancing each other and so forth and uh, so on. Now, what... What would be the mistake that we could make on this? Well, we could make the mistake, all government is horrible, it's terrible, there's, there's no good we can do in society. The only, thing, the only thing we should think about as Christians is getting people saved. You ought not to get involved in politics. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Would you rather live in the United States? We have problems, right? We can all say that. Would you rather live in Venezuela right now, right? Venezuela is a failed state under, you know, a Marxist-type rule. The, some, would you rather live in Somalia or here? So, right? Somalia is a mess, right? Some, yes, there's no heaven on earth, but some governments are better than others, right? In the already, not yet. There is, there is an already, so to speak, even, even in the political realm. Okay. Another example is marriage, right? So what's the example of Wanting heaven on earth, well, you know, 
Hollywood is the key example of this, right? That they, they can afford it. Of course, it's very common in our society. But, right, you just keep divorcing till you find that perfect spouse. Of course, then you just keep divorcing because that perfect spouse doesn't exist, right? So, um, so you know, you look for... M- m- what is that over-realized eschatology? You, 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 there, there, there's, that, there's that perfect person out there that's going to meet all my needs. But that's over-realized eschatology, isn't it? What's under-realized eschatology? I mean, you know, marriages are, marriages are terrible. Might as well stay with the person I got. It's horrible, you know? Really bad marriage. I mean, man. I'm not enjoying this at all, but what, what do we do, you know? Stick with the old man or the old lady, right? People talk like that, don't they? Well, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I put up with it. But, but that's under-realized eschatology, right? We, the, you know, we don't, we, we don't have perfect marriages, but we, ha- can, ha- we can have good marriages, right? So... That marriages can be good without being perfect. And um, they, they, they can be a testimony to God's grace, can't they? they, they, it, um, they, they we, we could be satisfied. I'm, I don't know what's happening in your life. You could be satisfied with your marriage when God wants you to grow. I mean, God wants us all to grow, right? To be more loving, to be a better spouse, no matter how long you've been married. I, 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 you know, God, God, God wants me to love Diane more. You know, I think we have a good marriage, but it can be better. It's not going to be perfect, but it can be good. What about church? So, what's over-realized eschatology? How does that show up? Now, right, I, you know, I, I'm not talking about every dimension of these issues. Right, these issues are complicated. There are times where it's right to leave a church. I believe that, but. Overrealized eschatology often shows up in church hopping, right? As people go from church to church to church looking for that perfect church. And they, you know, they're happy in the church, but then they disagree with the pastor on something or some, one thing comes up and they're out of there right away. Or they have some disagreement with the person in the congregation, they're gone. You know, and. And, and what are they looking for, really? When people do that, it's so common in our culture, isn't it? They're, they're looking for perfection, you know? I mean, I'm really tired of this church now. I want to try something else. And, uh, you know, in, ni- in 1998, I was part of a church plant. I went into the church plant. There were like six families there. I mean, they were amazing families. And I was like, wow, these people love each other so much. This is amazing. I love this place. But, you know, I stayed, and I began to say, oh, yeah, there's some tensions here. I didn't say it at the beginning. Oh, yeah, there's a little tension there. And, you know, hey, that's the way it is, right? That, that, that's the way life is. So, so there's church hobby. What, what's, what's, the, what's the problem on the other side, you know? Well, it's the Laodicean church, right? Kind of like marriage. Yeah, our church is awful. Yeah, why go to another one? They're all the same. You know, church is bad, you know. Man, it's just, uh, you, got, you got to go, though, I guess, you know. But no power, no joy, no enthusiasm in a church, right? But a church, a, a church isn't going to be perfect, right? Your, your, your pastor is not perfect, right? But, but, but he can be good. So, uh, yeah. Well, I want to say, I want to say, I'm not going to say the name, but I was in the church with a very famous pastor in the United States, one of the most famous around. Two or three hundred people left because they realized he wasn't perfect. And I'm, but he loves Jesus and he's a great pastor. And I met with a lot of those people and I'd say, did you think he was perfect? And they'd go, no, no, of course we don't think that. But they really wanted it, and, they, and they'd laugh for those reasons. They know in their heads one thing, but they're, they did something else, right? Oh, yes, yes, we know he's not perfect, but then they'd leave. And why were they leaving? The church was good, and the pastor was good. But, you know, every pastor is flawed. I'm flawed. There, there's nobody who's perfect, right? So 
But so quickly, people want, they, what do they want? They want heaven on earth. But a church can be good and solid, and God can use it. But we get used to it, you know? And then we think, oh, you know, I'm used to that. I want something new. There can be reasons to leave, right? But too often, instead of people going deeper with one another, with true love and commitment, they fly. And, and, and that hurts us because we, we don't become as mature. Because even in marriage, right, we all know our marriages grow deeper when we forgive each other and we stay committed to one another. So there's another example. How does it show up in, Christian, in the Christian life? Well, uh, the, uh, the over-realized eschatology is perfectionism, right? Yeah, you, very, very few people really believe this anymore, but that you could be morally perfect as a Christian. My first job... I actually taught at Azusa Pacific University. Now, I'm Reformed. Azusa Pacific University is in Southern California, and it's broadly Wesleyan. So in their statement of faith is a kind of Christian perfectionism taught by John Wesley, who was an amazing believer, right? But I think he was wrong on that. But the funny thing is, I didn't meet a single person there who believed that they'd achieved it. <laughs> I don't know what that doctrine means when you don't meet anybody who claims it, you know? Because I met nobody who claimed it, you know, which is quite, quite interesting. But, you know, the only person I've ever met who claimed to be perfect was a non-believer. I was witnessing to her, and she told me she had never sinned. She was 70 years old. I was like, what? I was so shocked, I didn't know what to say. But I should have said, you just sinned in saying you haven't sinned. <laughs> but anyway, so, but I didn't say anything because I didn't, I, I, I just, was so taken off guard by her claiming she'd never sinned. But anyway, that's over-realized eschatology. What's under-realized eschatology? Um, oh, you know, we just sin all the time. That's what the Christian life is. We're just failures, you know? What are we as Christians? We just fail every, all the time. Yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which we continue to struggle with sin, but right, but but the, the New Testament's optimistic, isn't it? What does Paul say in Galatians? Walk in the Spirit, right? And you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Be led by the Spirit. There's the fruit of the Spirit. He says, march and step with the Spirit. And so do the Spirit. We're not going to live perfect lives, but we can live lives that are pleasing to God because of the already, right? There's still a not yet in our life. There's still sin in our life. We're still flawed, but we're new, aren't we? We're a new creation. Okay, two more things. Uh, raising children. What's over-realized eschatology? We expect our kids to be perfect. Now, we all say, well, we don't expect our kids to be perfect, but there can be a kind of, you know, um, I'm, I'm just going to use this word, but I love people who are from this dimension, kind of a fundamentalist expectation out of a kid. They're going to be perfect, and especially in public. You know, our kids, they can't embarrass us by misbehaving in public, right? And then we can overreact as a parent, right? Because we're embarrassed because our kids are misbehaving, right? So, 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 so a home can become very rigid. Very, I didn't grow up in a home like this at all, but I've talked to people who have, uh, and very rigid, very legalistic, where m more is demanded of the kids than the parents live themselves. And there's not grace given to the kids, and it's a recipe. You've seen it. I've seen it. It's a recipe for the kids to rebel uh, when they're brought up with that kind of severity and that kind of expectation. What, what is that? It's like heaven on earth. You know, you ex you they're kids after all, right? They're, and and that's, that's what you're doing as a parent. And some kids, you know, we all know this. Some kids are harder than others, right? Some kids have very nice dispositions almost from the beginning. Some do not. <laughs> some are challenges, a great challenge. I could talk about our grandkids, but I'm not going to isolate children. Uh, but we have 11, you know, and some are easier than others. But, you know, that th we have hope for them all. But what's, uh, what's under-realized eschatology, you know? Well, there, there, there's, uh, there's no discipline. You know, 
your parents raised you that way, and then you go the other. And the kids are like, well, how do you explain it? When they come into your home, when they leave, you're like, praise the Lord, you know? Now, yeah, kids have moments, right? But what I mean is there's just no control of the kids. They just run wild, you know, without any... Kids need... We were all kids, right? So I can say this. Kids are little savages, right? <laughs> They're savages, you know? They need to be domesticated. They need a lot of rules, right? That's what they need. So there's got to be a lot of rules. There's got to be a lot of instructions. And if they don't have any, if there's no boundaries and there's no discipline, I mean, you know, that, that's a recipe for disaster. Kids can be good. They're, they're at different places, right? And we need great wisdom and patience, and we need help from others. Kids can be good without being perfect, right? So, yeah, that's another, another area. The last one, uh, the health and wealth gospel. The health and wealth gospel, what is, that's a prime example of over-realized eschatology. That's what heaven is. What's heaven? Total health. What's, what's heaven? Total riches, right? That's what's coming. The, 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 the health and wealth gospel promises something that we'll only receive at the end, right? Finally. But, but what's, the un, what's the under-realized eschatology? But God does bless us in this life, doesn't he? God does. God, you know, we don't have an absolute promise, do we? You know, we may die at five right, or 25, but God does give us health, and he blesses us as well. We don't, we don't want to say, we're not, it depends on a person's life, but God, God blesses in remarkable ways as well, and we want to recognize that and thank him for it, and recognize that's often true, that God, we're blessed materially, we're blessed in terms of our health, God has been very, very good to us as well. So we don't want to, we just don't want to say, you know what it means to be a Christian is we're just suffering every moment. That's not typically what happens. There is suffering, but there's not only suffering. So that's, you know, those are just some examples of, um, of uh, how this applies. I, I think, so what I want to argue is if you don't understand the already not yet, you don't understand some of the most important things in life. This is not just an academic thing. This is really important. So what I want to say is biblical theology is practical. It helps us with, uh, with uh, uh, our every, everyday lives.